Thank you all for joining us today for Sheltering Arms Institute's Community Transition Events. My name is Allison Clark, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Sheltering Arms Institute. In an effort to stay connected with you after discharge, we're providing quarterly education opportunities for patients and families. Our goal is to continue to share educational information, tips, strategies, and resources to continue to support your healing and recovery as you transition home. The future plan for our community transition events is to be held at on-site at Sheltering Arms Institute in our education conference room. But until then, we are pleased to provide a virtual option for our patients and family. We are going to be recording this presentation. So we are able to share this on our Sheltering Arms Institute YouTube channel in the future as resources for patients and families who couldn't make this event today. To protect your privacy during the question and answer portion of the program, I would ask that the presenter repeat the question before answering so we can edit your personal identification from the videos before posting this on our YouTube channel. For today's community transition event, I'd like to welcome Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson is our OT clinical leader here on the multi-specialty unit at Sheltering Arms Institute. And Nicole Gross is a strategic partnership manager from the Amputee Coalition, who will wrap up our session today, giving us uh, lots of resource education and information that you can use in the future. So Chris is going to discuss energy conservation and home safety, and then Nicole will follow up with an overview of the Amputee Coalition. So I think we're ready to get started. I'm gonna turn this over to Chris Anderson to begin the clinical education portion of the program. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Anderson, I'm occupational therapist here uh, on the multi specialty unit. And I'd like to talk about some energy conservation and home safety uh, after amputation. So let's move on. All right. What is energy conservation? Why it's important? Um, after you have an amputation and surgeries, you have decreased functional endurance, um, fatigues makes even the simplest tasks even more challenging. Um, fatigue can uh, sometimes strain relationships because most people you're going to have a caregiver uh, at times and you know just trying to, to find that balance. Um, and the amount of fatigue that you have during the day is going to vary. Um, sometimes you're going to feel better during some parts of the day versus other parts of the day. Um, so that's why energy conservation is important. So we're going to kind of talk about the, the, the four P's. We call it prioritizing, planning, pacing, and problem solving. So the first to be able to prioritize, um, to determine the amount of time each day you want to uh, dedicate to each particular task. Um, so being able to, when most people who are in therapy, we really, uh, one of the things that we focus on is, is, is focusing on your self-care skills. So how much time it took you in, you know, when you were in the hospital, how long it took you to, to do your daily tasks as compared to before you had surgery. It could have been a lot longer, could have been about the same. Um, prioritizing, limiting um, and eliminating unnecessary tasks, things that don't really necessarily need to be done. Um, trying to, to get those out of the way. Delegating, being able to let others uh, do for you for, for certain tasks. Modify or simply simplifying the tasks that you currently have um, and the, the remaining tasks that you have. Encouraging others to, to kind of be self-sufficient. What I mean by that is, you know, letting other people uh, kind of do some things and, and be able to take over some tasks at home and also learning to say no. Uh, sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. And one thing I talk about is when you go home uh, before COVID, people would want to 
uh, come over and visit and bring food and things, but being able to get acclimated to home and being saying to, to friends and family, you know what, I don't, I can't really have visitors right now. Let's schedule a time uh, for you to be able to come over because your focus needs to be on you uh, getting yourself uh, working on different things, getting back to getting back to life. So planning, one thing you want to do is keep a light day before you have something that's going to be busy and stressful. So if you know you're going to have a doctor's appointment or things like that, so have a light day before. So being able to kind of figure out, you know, I may just do my self-care skills and I may make myself something to eat, but that's not going to be a day that I do any laundry or cleaning the house or anything of that nature. Alternating your tasks, uh, stand when you have to, sit when you can. My example is a, a pot of water. While it's boiling on the stove, you can sit. You don't need to stand to watch it. You can still cut up maybe some fruits and vegetables for dinner or just sit and rest while the water's boiling. Stand when you need to stand for certain tasks. And also planning uh, periods during the day for rest and relaxation, because that's just important as being able to, to be active. The next uh, is pacing yourself. Uh, rest before you get tired. And that kind of, what I mean by that is talking about my gas tank analogy. So when, if you wake up in the morning and you feel good, you have energy, like a full tank of gas, like a car, when you're driving around, your car takes gas. Well, I'm the kind of person that when my car gets to three quarters of a tank, I go to the gas station and I go because it doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of money and I'm on my way. Same thing with your energy, being able to, okay, I'm about three quarters. I know I need to sit. I can still be productive. Like I said, cutting up vegetables. I may need to get on the computer and check my emails. This is a time that I could be making phone calls. I could be making a grocery list. You're still doing things but you're sitting and letting your body physically rest until that energy gets back up to closer to a, to a full tank of gas. Avoid getting involved in activities that exceed your endurance. Um, so being able to divide tasks, uh, dividing things into smaller tasks. So if uh, being able to, you know, if you're going to do a, do a meal, okay, can I split it up? So can I maybe cut up vegetables, do the prep work, take a little bit of a break and then and cook it later? and maybe having somebody help you with the cooking, like uh, getting things in and out of the oven and such. Um, avoid the need to rush yourself. So plan things out and work at a comfortable pace. So problem solving, um, you know, we all have the, the potential to make our lives better, easier, happier and less stressful. Um, but sometimes you just kind of need to, to think about a, a, new exam, a new way to do it. Um, so be innovative creative and open open to new ideas. Um, just because you've done it one way, a certain way, uh, doesn't always need to mean that you always need to do it that way. We can, in therapy, we work to getting back towards those tasks, but think about alternative ways to do things. It's okay to ask for help and allowing others to help you. Um, one of the hard things is letting people do things their way that may not necessarily be your way. So have that conversation with them when you're asking for some help. Try to tackle problems before they get too big um, and before they, they mushroom and become a huge problem. Um, so, all right. So some home safety things. Um, after you've had surgery, you know, people are at risk for falling. Um, you know, you could have had a history of falls. You could have prior balance problems, sometimes medications can put you at a fall risk with the side effects. Uh, if your vision is impaired, if you have decreased muscle strength, coordination, decreased sensation, you may not always know where your hands and feet are. So people can be at a fall at a kind of, you know, possible fall risk. Um, just some general advice, uh, just make sure that, that the carpeting, the floors, everything is kind of in, in, good, in good condition. Um, avoid the throw rugs, really roll them up and, and kind of get them out of the way. Have lighting, which is sufficient for you. Um, make sure it's bright enough so you can see things without a glare. Using night lights, especially um, in the bathroom and on stairways. Um, and sometimes they make uh, light switches that are illuminated. Um, so, you know, things like that, just making sure that, you know, that you have enough lighting. 
Okay. Um, just make sure that felt that telephones are positioned um, so you can have them. Um, having the phone uh, maybe by your nightstand at night, um, having your cell phone. Uh, most people have cell phones now, but have a cell phone either in your pocket, um, you know, on a carrier on your hip, something of that nature. Make sure electric cord, electrical cords are out of the way. And make sure that the furniture does not block your walkways. Things in the bathroom. Think about having grab bars installed kind of in the bath, bathtub and toileting areas. Make sure that there are non-skid surfaces on the floor. If you're going to use a bath mat, just make sure it's got the, the non-skid rubber backing so it doesn't slip when you're getting out. Make sure you try to dry yourself as much as you can before getting out of the bathtub. And then have a place to sit in the shower after amputations. Um, you know, all the until you get your prosthetic, even when you do, you know, you're not going to necessarily take it in the bathroom with you to take a bath. So having a seat, you know, definitely conserves energy and is a, is a lot safer. As far as the bedroom, just make sure there's a clear path to get in and out. Have next to your uh, on your side table, have eyeglasses if you need it, a phone, a clock, any medications that you might need to take at night or first thing in the morning. Um, just make sure that you have shoes. Uh, close to your bedside um, so that you are less likely to have a fall. And then if you need to have a bedside commode or a urinal just for safety in the middle of the night, if you have to go, it comes, may go kind of quick. So being able to safely get into the chair, into the bathroom, out of the chair, onto the commode might be too late. Um, so maybe having a bedside commode might be a, a good option. In the kitchen, just make sure that uh, you try to clear up any spills that may have happened. If you're unable to clean it up, get a paper towel or a towel over it just so people know, hey, there's a spill here. It needs to, to be cleaned up just for everybody's safety. Just make sure things, your cleaning and cooking supplies are located in areas that are not too high or too low. Let's see. Okay. All right, living room, same thing, kind of walkways, make sure the furniture is in, if you're in a wheelchair, there's enough room to get around if you're using a walker, just make sure that the, the furniture is, uh, is out of the way. Uh, make sure that, the, that they're safe and high enough for you to, to get up and down. Last thing I wanna talk about is medical alert systems. Um, there are definitely, there are examples of life alert, uh, medical guardian, things of that nature. The other thing, when I started teaching this class, um, somebody suggested to me, hey, what about Alexa? That's a great thing. Um, a lot of smartwatches now have uh, Siri, they have Google. So you can just, you know, use your phone or your smartwatch to, to be able to, to call if, uh, if you don't have the life alert and things of that nature. So, but just make sure that in your phone um, that you have uh, EMS family members in there, that way you can just, you know, say to your phone, hey, please call such and such a person. Uh, so let's see, I think here are some pictures of the watch. Sometimes they come on lanyards. They have uh, buttons to be able to have in the bathroom and such. Last slide, talking about fire safety, just make sure that you have smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and that they're in working order. Um, when an emergency happens, you don't have much time. Um, so make sure that you have those items. Make sure you know where your exit is and have an, have a, an action plan with uh, and discuss that with, with family and with friends. And big, no smoking. Um, if you or your family member are on oxygen at home, very combustible, and you know we don't want uh, any harmful things to happen. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the helpful tips and resources. I'm sure there's something in there that's going to be helpful for everyone. Okay, next I'd like to introduce Nicole Gross from the Amputee Coalition. She's the Strategic Partnership Manager for the Amputee Coalition. So welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Please let me know when you can see it. 
Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to introduce the Amputee Coalition. We're, we're so thankful for Sheltering Arms Institute to be one of our valued hospital partners. Um, it is an integral that we ensure that no one goes through their journey with limb loss or limb difference alone. And through the connection with our hospital partners, we can ensure that both the healthcare staff and the patients and their families learn about our mission, understand the value of peer support, and the ways that we can help connect communities together, um, all for the purpose of just making sure that those at risk for an amputation, those impacted by limb difference, and those that have gone through a traumatic amputation or other causes that relate to an amputation can connect with resources, education, and support. Um, as Allison mentioned, my name is Nicole Gross. I'm the strategic partnership with the Amputee Coalition, and I've been with the coalition for a little over three years. Uh, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my family has been personally impacted by limb loss um, after the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing, so I feel very connected to our mission and want to help others ensure that there are um, resources available um, to navigate you through the journey, both for the individuals impacted by limb loss as well as the caregivers. On this slide, you'll see that our mission is very powerful. We are reaching out and empowering people impacted by limb loss and limb difference to achieve their full potential through education, support, and advocacy, and to promote limb loss prevention. We're the leading national nonprofit supporting the 2.1 million people currently living with limb loss and limb difference in the United States. And as you will see on this slide, the need is great to help raise awareness and ensure that the needs of the growing population at risk for amputation is strong. There are currently 2.1 million people living with limb loss. Over 185 amputations occur per year. And those that are living with limb loss have a 40% increase in their lifetime healthcare costs in comparison to those living without limb loss. And there are 36% of people with limb loss living with depression. We know that currently in the state of the pandemic and the um, mental health crisis that that number has probably um, rapidly increased over this past year. So our work is pretty simple. We have four pillars of our mission. It's through education, support, connection, and advocacy. And who makes up our coalition are individuals living with limb loss and limb difference, family members, friends, and caregivers, clinical team members, hospitals and rehab centers, researchers, students, and relatable industries and nonprofit partners. A little history before we get into the rest of the slides. Back in 1986, a small group of amputee support group leaders recognized the need for an organization dedicated to the needs of people with limb loss. Working entirely as volunteers, they laid the foundation for what is now called the Amputee Coalition and for our mission. A key concept of supporting the limb loss and limb difference community is achieving this goal is also a focus on mental health and well being. This slide emphasizes our education. We do offer our patient resources for free for those in need. Our National Limb Loss Center currently serves over 650,000 people and disseminating over 20,000 of our resources with an 85% satisfaction rate. As a hospital partner, Sheltering Arms Institute receives our publications on an annual basis. The first one is our first step guide, which helps guide um, individuals impacted by limb loss through their first year and a half after limb loss. We also have a free bi-monthly magazine called In Motion. And we do have research partnerships that help expand a better understanding of our community. And then we also offer limb loss education days, um, typically in person, but now moving towards virtual so that we can connect with a mini conference experience for those impacted in their local communities and provide a day of education, adaptive activities and community connection. Through support, we have over 400 registered support groups throughout the country. We've currently partnered with over 60 hospitals and rehab facilities to provide support, our peer visitor trainings and educational materials on site. Our certified peer visitor program first launched our trainings back in 1993, where we have served over 1,500 certified peer visitors to meet individuals and families during their times of need. 
Back in 2018, we launched a free support app through the Apple App Store and Google Play. And there's also a web browser link on this slide, originally to help our peer visitors report their peer visits, but further expansions have helped the patients be able to self-match themselves with an available volunteer. And this app is HIPAA compliant and provides in-app texting and in-app video chatting. There are valuable benefits of peer support, both for the patients and their families, as well as the volunteers who are providing the support and the hospital health system. Some of them include having a healthier mindset and making healthier lifestyle choices, gaining a better sense of community, feeling a renewed sense of purpose. There's a de decrease in hospital readmissions through peer support, as well as an increase in a patient's self-advocacy and self-determination. So there are a variety of ways to stay connected with the coalition, oftentimes through our events. On an annual basis, we hold our flagship programs, which is a national conference that draws nearly um, 1,500 attendees each year with over 80 educational sessions. Last year, we switched to a virtual conference experience where we had a record turnout of our community members who are living with limb loss or caregivers. And we are hoping that this year we can provide a, a hybrid experience, both virtual and in person, if safe to um, resume in person conferences. And our Patty Rossback Youth Camp provides a magical one week camp for free for kids ages 10 through 17 who are born with limb difference or undergo an amputation. We also have our youth camp counselors and leadership counselors who are also living with limb loss and limb difference. Our advocacy efforts primarily take place heavily in the month of April during Limb Loss and Limb Difference Awareness Month. When we were able to go in person, we would go up on the hill after undergoing some advocacy training to help educate legislators and our local governments to understand the insurance fairness rights of those living with limb loss and limb difference and the impact of the health care costs associated with it. We have um, details on our website about our 2021 advocacy forum um, currently taking place in the month of April over two days virtually. So we'd love to have any interest from your community that would like to get involved in advocacy and sharing your voice and your stories. And on the next slide is about awareness. As mentioned, April is our awareness month. The last Saturday of April each month is Show Your Medal Day. We have information on our website currently about how you can get involved through this campaign. And as mentioned, our advocacy forum takes place each April. After discharge, we'd love to connect with patients and families to ensure that you are getting the resources that you need as your journey evolves. So this slide provides you some ways to connect with our National Limb Loss Resource Center at 888-267-5669 or visit our website at www.amputee-coalition.org. We also are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And before closing, I just wanna say thank you to Sheltering Arms Institute for the valued partnership. We have provided additional resources that are available um, for patients upon discharge for takeaway handouts. If you choose to accept a peer visit, if it's offered to you during your stay, we would love to connect you with a certified peer visitor or a certified family peer visitor. But we also know that there may be opportunities to feel more interested in a peer visit when you're not so overwhelmed in the hospital. So there are ways that you can stay connected with us through some handouts that are provided to you. You can request a peer visit directly from our website through an online request form. You can call the coalition through our 800 number. You can send an email to peer support at amputee-coalition.org, or you can download our support app from the Apple App Store or Google Play or on the web browser link that's also available on our website. We want to make sure that you have the resources and the connection to support to ensure that you don't feel alone on your journey. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit of insight as to the big mission of the Amputee Coalition, and we would love to stay connected with you to help you stay connected. Thank you so much, Nicole. We greatly appreciate all the resources and information that you share with us so we can pass it on to our patients. 
Uh, it's a fantastic resource and I encourage everybody to uh, reach out to the Amputee Coalition. They provide uh, fantastic services that can really help you in your journey across uh, your entire recovery. So thank you so much. And that concludes our presentation for today. Our next amputee community transition event will be in June. Um, and we will be emailing invitations out to folks to participate. Uh, these will soon be posted on our Sheltering Arms Institute YouTube channel for your reference in the future. So thank you so much for Chris and Nicole for your time today. We greatly appreciate it.